Uh, I'm Matt Stay again from the Festival of Martial Arts. And today I've got with me Dan Woodruff. Hi, Dan. How are you? Hey, awesome. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, we, we've just had a, a quick off air topic of conversation. It's like, let's hit record and let's say everything instead, because this is really good stuff that people can uh, can absorb. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's always it's always great chatting with you. And so, yeah, it's no wonder that uh, we're off and running before we set the camera going. So um, thank you for being on board today for the conversation. Thank you for that saying was... uh, yesterday to coming along to the festival. And so we start these always the same way, which is can you give us a, a brief overview of who you are, what you do, and uh, and your history, and what brought you here. Uh, what brought me here was uh, a conversation with you about running the festival. We need awesome people. I'm like, oh, I'm nearly awesome. I'll help. Um, yeah, so my background, actually, it's coming up to 30 years since I passed my white belt in uh, in kickboxing and sport karate. The, eight, the, the 10th of June is, is when I've done um, 30 years in martial arts. So that's pretty cool. Um train with various people from around the world when people say like what kind of styles have you done it's more like what kind of styles have i not done i've done um so kickboxing is my bread and butter stay with that forever but then done so much stuff with with loads of other people just, it's just that case of i think when you become the martial arts junkie like i want to go and learn from the best people that i can find so I did bjj for a number of years taekwondo for a number of years everything from tai chi to uh, knife fighting to yeah loads of stuff so that's kind of me now i sold my i had a very big school um for 18 years sold it back in 2020 now i help other martial arts school owners to grow their school and double their profits in as little as 90 days but then also teach sales on an international level so there's a couple of multi-million dollar coaches that um use me to go and teach We'll use the word sales but we'll come back to that because i always teach how to sell without ever having to sell um that's called an open loop. Yeah, so we'll come back to it in a second. So that's what I do now and, and just generally just help awesome people to become even more awesome than ever before. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Me and the viewers have seen enough Billy Connolly to understand what an open loop is. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the master of it back in the so, day. Some of those young ones might not have. No, you're right, actually. Yeah, that's a long time ago now, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to the sales thing in a moment because obviously that's a word that by itself creates an emotional response in people could be negative or positive. So I want to come back to that a little bit further down the line. Now, um, you talked about having a, a large school of your own and you talk about how you sold that in 2020. Now, yeah. um, just as an aside, right, what what do you love about not being a full time martial arts instructor now and what do you miss about it? Oh, good question. Um, what do I like about it? Um, my, my story goes, um, I sold it just because I, because I'm weird, but just had a, a, a compulsive urge, never had anything so strong before saying, you need to get rid of your school. Uh, and I ended up sending it. Um, what do I love about not having a school? That the only thing I love is having the freedom to be able to now teach when I want to teach. So with, with friends I've got all over the shop, same my clients, sometimes I'll go and teach for them or I might do a seminar or I might help someone out teach. One of my friends is like, dude, I'm going away for the weekend. My instructors let me down. What can you do? And I'm like, yeah, no, it's dude, I'll go and teach. So it's that ability to have the freedom to go and teach who I want to teach when I want to teach it. Fantastic. Uh, rather yep. than having to go and teach when you might not want to after mm. I would start teaching in I think 98 so teaching for for quite a fair few number of years had my own school kind of 20 mm. 2002 is when um had school ripped off by a partner bought him out in 2005 yeah three checks for him one check for me Hmm, I suspect something dodgy is going on here um yeah so taught for 18 years literally Monday through to Saturday like four o'clock to nine or not at nine o'clock there was times you some of you guys listening to this might know the same thing that you work i started off doing a nine to five job and then going and teaching six or nine until mm -hmm. i've made started making enough money got enough students to be able to quit that full time um and then go full time and then take on a, a, a part-time instructor and then making them a full-time instructor grow a, a big team so yeah it's it's the ability to be able to it, it's freedom it's the masculine mm -hmm energy before we go too crazy of being yeah. able to do what you want when you want to be able to do it yes what do i miss i miss seeing the progression of people having whether it's a it's a kid or an adult coming in who uh, i always used to, to work a lot on people's confidence so when you see a little kid 
who comes in who's not even confident to say hello they're hiding behind mum's legs doing that little thing when they kind of peek out and then within a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months they're kind of stood at the front of the class and showing off their techniques it, it's ace but then now that the whole fact of seeing people that i've helped for, for 20 years and they've grown up and in, in, and had kids of their own mm. and they're messaging me saying you still got your school i'd love my kids to come to you and i'm like ah dude sorry mate no um so yeah that's that's kind of what i miss also the the energy that we we, we created spent a huge time to create a real community feel in my school um build a great team of people up um yeah miss the energy the teamwork the connection the community um yeah, I think that's what I miss most. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting stuff, isn't it? And that your first part of that response is, I think, going to be my open loop for a little bit later on because we will come back on uh, on that and 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 some of the points that you made there. Now, <clears throat> when you look at um, where you are now and what you're doing now, because it's great to have an overview of of, of sort of, of of history and and where you sort of came from and what brought you to this point, um, but it's always better to sort of focus on. What's tomorrow? What's coming next? What's the, um, you know, where, where, where is this going? Um, you talk a lot about mindset. You talk a lot about attitude. You talk a lot about, um, you know, you as an individual and how you approach the world can make such a difference to how the world comes back to you, if you like. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, without trying to um, go on, I could go for about another three hours about this. Um, yeah, it's, it's the old phrase, you get out, you get back what you put out. So if we are, like the very first thing you said to me is, how are you? And I'm like, I've got two arms, I've got two legs and I'm alive. Today is an awesome day. So many people wake up and because they're thinking of their problems, automatically the universe is going to send that energy back. So imagine that we all like, we're walking antennas um, with an, an FM or AM radio. So whatever signal you send out, you're going to receive that back. So if we wake up and, and go, man, I'm alive again. How cool is this? We mm. send out that happiness, that joy, those good positive positive vibes. Um, so we, effectively, we're sending out a signal to the great multi-world universe place. And it just gives us that back. It's like you can't tune into Radio 1 if you're tuning into, uh, I don't know, like an AM radio station. It's not going to work. So if we want to feel good, it's the other way around. People always think, well, if this happens, then I'll feel good. But it's the other way around. You have to feel good in order for the good things to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. Again, it's an it's an interesting thing in the world, isn't it, that you... um. Uh, I take this festival as an example you know it was um, I, I went to a I went to an event space and I was looking at a very small event for 100 150 people for a day and I was going to hire a portion of that space right and I got there yeah. and it was just so phenomenal it was such an amazing event uh, I went to the uh, the owner and I went well how much is this going to cost for the whole thing for the entire weekend lock stock everything he gave me a number I had a little bit of a wobble and then I was like, right, no, that's it. We got, I'd go for it, you know, because the universe I think was telling me. Um, and, and that was, you know, that was a, a moment where it was like, well, okay, it's now real in the world. And amazing people like yourself are all coming forward or being part of it. And something astounding is being created on the back of a positive action. Um, yeah. the, you know, and, and that's, is, isn't it? It is funny how the world works like that, but it definitely does. There's, it's been proven time and time again. Um, so aside from the uh, mental side of things and the mindset side of things, there's also the very real understanding of the, you know, there, there needs to be a, um, an awareness of business, an awareness of protocols, an awareness of structure, an awareness of, well, basically just making something work successfully. Now, we're not yeah. talking about selling out or, or giving up or, or changing or weakening it or watering down what you do we're talking about, you know, basic infrastructure and things to make a solid business so that the wheels turn smooth. Yeah. So yeah. when we look at that, the word that springs to mind when you talk about big dojos and things is uh, muck dojo, which, you know, you and I have both, uh, we talked about this very briefly before we got on camera and we said, actually, this is a conversation we should be having on camera, mm. which is why I'm bringing it up now. So first and foremost, an overview of what is a muck dojo in, uh, from your point of view? Um, 
Uh, I I mean, this is something that's been banded around for decades now, isn't it? Oh, they're a McDojo. They've got 200, 400, 6 million students. Like, oh, they must be a McDojo. Like, they've got a student in these rubbish and all their students are rubbish and they're terrible and they're just handing out black belts as long as you hand out money. Um, like I had a big school, but I had standards. So whenever, you'll probably like this as well, and a lot of people listening probably have this same theory is that there's an ind- if to hand or to award someone a belt there's a certain level that they have to achieve and that's i believe very much there's a an industry standard that they have to meet but also a personal standard so you've probably had a, a, a kid who's come in who's just a naturally phenomenal athlete they're absolutely incredible they could pass any test you give them yesterday and they could be like a, a 16th degree black belt because they could just do everything like that. Then you've got the complete opposite end of the spectrum of the nervous kid who comes in, like we said, the, the unconfident kid who's maybe a bit dyspraxic, so their coordination isn't good, their balance isn't, balance isn't as good, they might have some um, slow progress, progression in their uh, motor skills, whether that's gross or refined ones, and they're just never going to be naturally talented. So it's like, well, okay, if they're improving to a certain level, should it be fair to say, well, you're never going to be a black belt standard because you're naturally untalented and no matter how much work you put in, no matter how much dedication, no matter how much you persevere and try and show a load of black belt quality skills that we try and develop within people, you're never going to be a black belt just because you can't kick this high because of your natural flexibility is restricting you that way. So for me, that's that's one of the things that I always look at is a personal level versus an industry standard. But then so when you look at McDojo, so if you looked at my school, um, we were at 360, just over 360, we were at the biggest. I got some phenomenal martial artists in terms of natural skills kicking ability sparring ability their fitness was like holy cowbells this is amazing but then you had the other end of the spectrum where they're just not naturally talented and they're never going to be so if someone coming in they could look and say well why is that person that belt oh you must be a dojo just because you've got loads of students it's like there's there's, there's two sides of the coin mm. If, if yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in terms of McDojo, the more students you've got, the more of that imbalance you're going to have. You have 10% natural ability, 10% very unnatural ability, and everyone else in between. Mm. So, if you've got a school of 360 people, if there's 10, 10%, I'm going to have about 30, 40 people who are just naturally untalented and probably don't look like they should be wearing the belts that they should. But I believe that they should because I know where they've come from and where they've gone to. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good explanation of it. There's um, again, it's one of those words that creates that sort of um, a a moral judgment from people one way or the other, depending on where they sit. And so you have that. Well, if you're going to grow and if you're going to create a series of clubs or franchise model of clubs or um, or anything like that then you've you've got to be a mcdojo to do so there's the point of view that has that and what they mean by Mm. that is obviously that watering down of standards and belt factories and all the rest of it and yes those things do exist in the world there's absolutely no question about that um but we're not really talking about that in in that regard what we're talking about is um the fact that it's not actually necessary to become a mcdojo to grow um, or to have a successful business. You know, if you look at, and this is where this is where I find this fascinating because the people that push back are really push back. And again, I've been guilty of this myself in the past because I do run a relatively small club. I've grown it before. I didn't like it. I hate being a manager. I'm not interested in, you know, having a bunch of people in my club that I don't personally know. So mm. I ended up scaling it back down to where I'm happy. And that's where I am happy. And that's where it sits now. And that works great for me. But other people, uh, you know, want more. Other people want less, so on and so forth. So, um, we're in a world now where when we look at it, if you think about the original karate or judo, when it first sort of came out a hundred or so years ago, that was essentially what people would now class as a McDojo. It was structured. It was standardized. There was belt systems introduced. And there was, there was all these things that people now would, would say that. And then when you come further down the line, you say, okay, what about the Gracies, right? Who's going to call the Gracies a McDojo? Hmm. realistically but then when you look at their business model and how they've gone out globally into the world well that's 
like the biggest franchise model going at the moment kind of thing, isn't it? So yeah. um, it's really interesting that the, the dynamics of it, and we are moving into a world where it does appear that the franchise model of, of, of a sort of kickboxing taekwondo kind of style it seems to be doing very, very well at the moment. Um, and there seems to, there seems to be a lot of growth within those areas now. Um, so that's really where we're heading now with regards to the conversation is because I know some people think that growth is a negative word. Um, and again, I want, if possible, can you sort of give us an idea of, of how people can progress without falling into those traps? Definitely. It's, it's a really good point in that it boils down to people's mentality. So you see the McDojo. I don't want to be a McDojo. I never wanted to be a McDojo. Didn't think I was. Some people would classify me as that. But obviously, as we've got more people coming to the festival who have got the smaller numbers, I believe it's a lot about mentality and understanding that it's okay to make money from your profession. Mm. So if you've only got the 30, 40, 50 students, that's great. If you only want, like, like yourself, you only want 30, 40, 50 students, that's great. If you want the 500, the 1,000, that's great too. The reason why I help school owners to grow their schools now is so it impacts their communities. Mm. So I think martial arts has evolved from the early days of just a very strict teaching of karate and judo, etc., to now being able to understand that, hang on a second, there's, we can teach kids how to be more confident. We can teach kids to be more respectful, mm. more disciplined. We can teach them to not give up in a world that's teaching them to give up. So now it's that case of seeing that you don't, have to be at dojo you can still keep the same standards but if you want to there's a recipe that you have to follow in order to grow your school bigger so that you can impact more people in the community mm, it's, like, yeah, totally. it's like a cake recipe you can't uh, build a chocolate cake if you don't follow the exact recipe and do these exact steps but if you do it's just going to all fall apart again and i see you've probably seen as well so many school owners who tried to build their school and then it's all fallen apart because they haven't followed that specific recipe. It's the same pretty much for every business. I've coached different businesses around the world. And there's a pretty much a formula that you need to follow in order to grow. Mm. But then it's helping people to see through their mentality that if the more people you help, the more your community you're going to help. Mm. With people who are more, excuse me, my virus carriers going off like, Ugh. um. You're going to help more people in your community with, with kids who are going to grow up, who are going to have, be more confident so they can stand up for themselves, they can stand up for the, their friends. You're going to have people who are more respectful, so you've just got nicer, more polite people around you. You're going to have people who are growing up, who are learning the skill of commitment. Because mm. let's face it, in the world of scroll, 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 like no one's got any attention span, so being able to give the kids the skill of focus and concentration it's huge. And for mm. me, that's the reason why I wanted to grow my school is to just help more people. Mm. So if you're at that kind of 30, 40 students, you think they've come into the festival and thinking, well, I don't want to be a McDojo. You don't have to be. Mm. Your school is, I often say your outside world is a reflection of your inside beliefs. Mm. So I know you've got a really good mindset coach coming, which everybody needs to, to, to go and listen to, but that will help you to change your beliefs around what you can actually achieve versus what you can't achieve because you've got these limiting beliefs of what mm. what that actually looks like for you yeah yeah well again it's interesting isn't it because you're talking there about the reality of the world is if if, if you're just going to complain about the world being swallowed up by giant mcjojo franchises right whether that's true or not is irrelevant but if you're going to complain about that but you're not actively doing anything about it you're staying mm. in your tiny little space and, and making yourself as small as possible on purpose then you can't really have an opinion in the world. You know, if you want to be the change, isn't it, basically? And as you say, you know, affect your community, affect the kids growing up around you, affect the next generation and, you know, and, and work hard to pass on your, um, you know, your core beliefs and, and your culture and your energy. And so how do, how do new schools do that? So if you've got an instructor with a, a small student base that's working out of a village hall, you know, how do they get from that to what is essentially a business because you know let's be honest a person that is working all day in a job to pay the bills and then racing off to class for a couple of hours a night with not having any a support structure or team around them you know that's not a business that's a job and yeah. so how do they start to take those steps there's there's a number of steps they can take number one it's just letting more people know what you do um i think for a lot of 
school owners they think in order for them to be authentic they've just got to teach martial arts and i'm just going to teach get get they'll like um in enter the dragon is it with at the end when they're on the island and there's all the people there just stood there just doing like loads of punches and not moving um there's different ways of teaching now just like education has started to change and evolve there's so many different training methods that we can use to train and evolve to make classes more entertaining but to teach those life skills and then helping more people to know what it is you actually do mm. i think that the days of just teaching kick and punch if, if you want to have a, a, a massive huge school well what's the phrase um people become try and fit their no people try and fit their martial arts around their life until they become a student then they fit their martial arts no <laughs> you get the idea <laughs> my brain's just gone shut down oh, that's okay yeah. <laughs> um so it's it's a fact of if if you want more students if you want your school to grow you have to tell more people about what you do but also tell more people about the results that you give them Mm. If you're just saying like yeah we, we teach kick and punch and little billy's just won this tournament or that tournament or the other tournament do parents really want kids to go out and fight in tournaments these days or would they like them to learn a little bit more manners be a little more, more respectful and have the discipline to do the homework when they're actually asked to do mm. and at the same time learn the skills that can help them to look after themselves so if you go out into your community and start telling more people through using different streams of marketing it's not just Online, obviously, online is huge, but there's so many more offline methods that you can use to go and tell people about what you do, whether that's seminars at local schools, packing bags in Sainsbury's and just striking up a conversation. Hey, do you know about the benefits that a martial arts program could do for your child? Mm. Um, it, it starts starts with telling more people about what you do. Mm. I think well, actually before that, you've got to work out what your brand's message actually means. Your brand is very much... It's not about colors or logo or what your website looks like. It's about what people say about you when you're not in the room. Yeah, well, that's a whole different um, and a yeah. very deep yeah. well, <laughs> we, could, we could pull apart on that. Um, yeah. So that brings us, obviously, because I'm aware that we're limited on time here. So that brings us to the festival itself and your presentation on that. Now, again, we we spoke very briefly before we turned the cameras on and uh, the word sales came up. And again, I'm aware, I'm aware that's a very emotive word for people, but as you just described then, I mean, realistically, if you want your school to be healthy, if you want to be in a position where you can help people, and if you want to be in a position where it's sustainable as well, you know, you're not worrying yeah. week for week about paying the hall fees and things, then a factor of that is you do have to sell. Yeah. Right? Um, but there are ways to go about that. Right. And that's where I think you um, you've you know, you've got an opinion on this and you've got a certain way of going about it. Yeah, 100 um, percent. Like you said, if someone wants to grow their school, they've got to tell more people what you do and they've got to show them if it's going to be of benefit to them. So when a lot of people hear the word sales, I always say people feel like the cheesy, sleazy car salesman. The, the, I've got to I've got to try and manipulate this person. I've got to try and get them to join. Like you haven't got to get anyone to do anything. The way that I teach sales is I call it a conversional conversation. I'm going to have a conversation with someone very much like a doctor. I, I teach people to, to, to think like that doctor as in, look, you've come to me because it would appear you've got a problem. What's the problem? Okay, here's a solution. Would you like it? that's pretty much what it boils down to mm. so instead of trying to convince someone or trying to manipulate someone that means you're trying to get someone to do something for your gain the way that i teach sales we call it heart-based sales so it's effectively you're trying to help someone to see is this the right thing for me what's your pain what's your problem what are your symptoms okay then we've got something that can actually help to alleviate for you would you like it it's as simple as that. It, it's finding out, just like a doctor does, like I said, it's it's that question of what's your problem? Can I help you? Here's a solution. Would you like it? So at no point am I trying to manipulate or convince. It's always about sometimes you have to use persuasion. I think persuasion is when you're showing someone if it's right for them or not and then holding their hand and then helping them to come over to your side. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Again, is that as you said, the used car salesman, salesman kind of vibe on it. And the the thing is, uh, and this is a fundamental thing. If if you're if you're looking at sales as 
essentially just taking money from somebody, you know, over promising and under delivering, that's not a healthy business. That's not a, that's not a business that's going to be sustainable. And so it, that's counterproductive doing that because the trust is gone right from the word go, isn't it? So that's, that's not what we're talking about at all, is it? Not at all. No, 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 no. Um, the formula that you said about going to jumping back for a second, because I know my brain goes off at mad tangents is how to grow your school. Tell more people what you do. Show more people how to get involved with you. Keep them training with you. So I teach my guys is that when we are in that conversional conversation, when someone first comes in to see us and say, hey, what's the big challenge your child is facing at the moment? Retention starts there. Mm. It doesn't start when they want to quit. Your retention starts as soon as someone walks through the door because you're giving them a reason on why they need to train with you. If they haven't got a reason to train, when money starts getting tight or the winter nights come in or summer nights come out and everyone's off down the park, oh, he doesn't want to do it anymore, mm. then that's probably why they're going to quit because they've forgotten the reason why they need what you actually do. Mm. Yeah, that's again, that's an important point. So um, at the, for the festival itself, then your presentations are, do you have an idea of what you're going to be uh, discussing i presume it's in and around what we've what we've already been talking yeah. about definitely showing people how to get more people enrolled in a way that you feel congruent and comfortable and confident okay because yeah, if no, not if you feel like you're trying to get something off someone you've got that negative energy like we said and you you just get back what you put out so they will feel negative so they'll feel like oh, don't join so it's a way to show somebody look have you got a big enough problem is it causing you an emotional pain? Here's a solution. Would you like it? This is what you need to do next. So yeah. that's all. I'll, I'll put it under the banner of sales. Although, like we cite this call, I, I don't like to use the word sales so much. Although, if you've ever heard of Grant Cardone, he, he quite correctly says that everything in the world is a sale. You yes. want to attract the girl or the boy, you've got to sell yourself to them. You want to get a job, you've got to sell yourself to them. If yes. you want to go out to Hickory's, mm, love Hickory's, the, the restaurant, but your wife doesn't, you've got to sell her on the idea of why it's going to be good for them. Yes. So everything's a sale. So what I teach sales wise, it's not just usable within your school. It's usable like everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So essentially it's learning how to sell without running around shouting 10 X at everyone in a very loud voice. <laughs> baby, yeah. yeah, definitely. No, it's very relaxed. It's it's mm. having a conversation. So how can you have a conversation with someone and never sell, but they end up asking you how to buy from you? Yeah, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And, and, and I do, you know, I, I do believe strongly that um, a lot of a lot of the barriers that stop people from progressing, and I, when I say progressing, I don't necessarily mean building a monster school with thousands of students. I mean making themselves in a position where they're happy with where they are. If they only want 20 students and once a week, great, you know, but it's getting there as being happy in that. So, um, yeah, so I, I think it's a conversation that's going to be really interesting and a talk that's going to be really interesting. And so it's one of those where, you know, for those, for those that are turned off by marketing and sales and that kind of thing, then don't be because the whole point of these conversations at the festival is to show you that, you know, they, they can be done without selling your soul. Basically, that's really what yeah. we're after with all of these talks. So um, how can people reach you between now and then if they want to get in touch? Uh, Facebook is is my number one um, chosen method. So look me up, Dan Woodruff. Um, I think I'm Danny Woodruff, the kickboxer, I think is my actual like facebook.com thingy but yeah find me on facebook send me a friend request shoot me a message um yeah that's the best and easiest way okay fantastic I'll, i will link that down in the comments below so uh thank you dan for coming on today and having a chat and thank you for coming and speaking at the festival uh we look forward to hearing more then awesome cheers dude i can't wait to be there i want to be there now it's exciting <laughs> it'll be soon <laughs>